Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, September the 24th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night in peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts, and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Our New Testament reading tonight is 1 Timothy chapter 6. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And our reading from the Book of Concord tonight, from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 5, on love and fulfilling the law, and we will actually be finishing it tonight. So that tomorrow night, we will begin looking at Articles 7 and 8 on the Church, in which we will be in for a few days, and then that is followed by Baptism in the Lord's Supper. Uh, There is no Article 6. The way these articles are uh, numbered in this reader's edition are a bit um, odd, but we won't be skipping any parts. According to 1 Corinthians 3.8, each will receive his wages according to his labor. The righteousness of the gospel, which has to do with the promise of grace, freely receives justification and new life. 
but the fulfilling of the law which follows faith has to do with the law. In it, a reward is offered and is due, not freely, but according to our works. Those who earn this are justified before they, before they do the law. As Paul says, he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, and we are fellow heirs with Christ. But whenever merit is mentioned, the adversaries immediately transfer the matter from other rewards to justification. Yet the gospel freely offers justification because of Christ's merits and not of our own. His merits are delivered to us through faith. Works and troubles do not merit justification, but other payments, as the reward is offered for the works in these passages. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Here clearly the measure of the reward is connected with the measure of the work. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land, Exodus 20, verse 12. Also here, the law offers a reward to a certain work. The fulfilling of the law earns a reward, for a reward properly relates to the law. Yet we should be mindful of the gospel, which freely offers justification for Christ's sake. We neither obey the law nor can obey it, before we have been reconciled to God, justified and reborn. Nor would fulfilling the law please God unless we were accepted because of faith. People are accepted because of faith. For this very reason, the initial fulfilling of the law pleases and has reward in this life and in the next. Regarding the term reward, many other remarks derived from the nature of the law might be made here. Since they are too long, they must be explained in another connection. The Adversaries' Other Arguments The adversaries insist that good works have the right to merit eternal life because, Paul says, he will render to each one according to his works, glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. In these and all similar passages in which works are praised in the scriptures, it is necessary to understand not only outward works, but also the faith of the heart. Scripture does not speak of hypocrisy, but of the righteousness of the heart with its fruit. Furthermore, whenever the law and works are mentioned, we must know that Christ cannot be excluded as mediator. He is the end of the law, and he himself says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We have said above that all passages about works can be judged according to this rule. When eternal life is granted to works, it is granted to those who have been justified. Only justified people who are led by the Spirit of Christ can do good works. Without faith and Christ as mediator, good works do not please, according to Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. When Paul says he will render to each one according to his works, not only the outward work ought to be understood, but all righteousness or unrighteousness. So glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, namely to the righteous. You gave me food, Matthew twenty-five thirty-five, is cited as the fruit and witness of the righteousness of the heart and of faith, and therefore eternal life is given to righteousness. In this way, Scripture, at the same time with the fruit, embraces the righteousness of the heart. Scripture often names the fruit so that inexperienced understand better. It also names them to show that a new life and rebirth are required and not hypocrisy. But rebirth happens through faith and repentance. No sane person can judge otherwise, neither do we needlessly attempt to make a fine distinction, trying to separate the fruit from the righteousness of the heart. If only the adversaries would have conceded that the fruit pleases because of faith and because of Christ as mediator, and that by themselves they are not worthy of grace and of eternal life. We condemn this failure in the doctrine of the adversaries. In some passages of Scripture, understood either in a philosophical or a Jewish manner, they abolish, abolish the righteousness of faith and exclude Christ as mediator. From these passages, they conclude that works merit grace, sometimes in a merely agreeable way, and at other times in a wholly deserving way, namely when love is added. They maintain that works justify, and because they are righteous, they are worthy of eternal life. This error clearly abolishes the righteousness of faith, which believes we have access to God for Christ's sake, not for the sake of our works. It also contradicts the truth that through Christ as priest and mediator, we are led to the Father, and have a reconciled father, as has been said well enough before. This teaching about the righteousness of faith is not to be neglected in Christ's church, because without it, we cannot consider Christ's office. Then the doctrine of justification that is left is only a doctrine of the law. We should keep the gospel and the doctrine about the promise granted for Christ's sake.
and that is the end. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But, ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity, where you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, by your grace, hear the prayers of your church. Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive through your bountiful mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.